When I think of Kurt's Bleach era guitars, my mind puts them into two categories, the High Flyers and the Others. The Others were usually guitars that did not last very long. They seemed to be whatever Kurt could find and afford at the time, and they were usually destined to get smashed after not that much use. And it seems like Kurt himself didn't really care for most of them. I would like to explain to everyone something. My guitar, she's broken. She's broken. It doesn't do with the shit. But of the others, there is one guitar that does stand out. The Epiphone ET270. This guitar had a relatively long life for that era, and there's evidence to suggest that Kurt actually really liked it. The ET270 was made from 1970 to 1975 in the Matsumoku Guitar Factory in Japan. Guitars made in this factory in the 60s, 70s, and 80s are highly sought after and are held in high regard. It was the first solid body Japanese Epiphone. When it was first released in 1970, it was called the 1802T, but the name was later changed to ET270. Brand new, these cost $159 in 1974, which roughly equals $959 in 2022. As far as I could tell in my research, this model was only made in that five year period and were only available in right-handed models. I have found some in different colors other than red, but I'm not sure if these were offered in those colors or if these were later refinished. There seem to be a few slight variations of it, the main difference notably being where the Epiphone E logo is. There are some without it, some where it's by the knobs, and some where it's in between the pickups, which is what Kurtz was like. It has two single coil pickups, three-way pickup selector, a bass boost switch, and a vibrola system. Interestingly, it also has a bridge cover, which can easily come off. Kurt is first seen using his on January 19, 1990, at the Olympia Rignall Hall Show. He used it heavily from this point on, until he smashed it on April 26, 1990, at the Pyramid Club in New York. It lasted for four months, and seems to have been his main guitar in this period, with it being used for the majority or the entirety of the shows between those dates. In that time period, his rig, in addition to this guitar, was three Sun Beta Elite heads, Soundtech and Bullfrog caps, Boss DS1, and an Arion stage tuner. I've seen the claim that he recorded Bleach with this guitar. Specifically, I've seen people saying that he recorded About a Girl with it, but the timeline does not add up. Bleach was recorded in three different sessions throughout 1988, with two of Kurt's Phase 3 High Flyers. That's two years before we first see him with this guitar. So it was not used on Bleach, but it was used at a pretty important recording session. While on the Bleach North American tour in the spring of 1990, Nirvana recorded what they thought was going to be their second sub pop album at Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin with Butch Vig. These eight songs were recorded with the plan being that more would be recorded with Jack and Dino in Seattle after the tour, and then that would be their second album. This plan was scrapped, as drummer Chad Chaney parted ways with the band in either May or June of 1990 after the end of that tour. So in retrospect, this session has become known as the Nevermind Demo Session, but at the time, the band fully thought that they were recording their second album. We know this because at multiple shows on that tour, before playing In Bloom or Dive, Kurt or Chris would say, We got a new record coming out in September. And uh, it's gonna be one of the songs off that record. Also, in this April 1990 interview, they talk about their second album and they say that it will be coming out in September of that year. The Smart Sessions took place on April 2nd through the 6th, in the middle of that tour. From what we know about what gear Kurt was using at the time, it's easy to guess that the ET270 was the main if not only electric guitar he had with him at those sessions. I think it's most likely that he used it on every song, apart from Polly, which was his acoustic Stella Harmony. In fact, this fan, who was at the April 1st Chicago show, talked to Kurt at the show and has said that Kurt only had his Epiphone with him. The session started the next day. For Kurt to use only one guitar 
on so many songs for what he thought would be his next album suggests that he really did like the tones he got out of it. To me, it sounds like he got full use out of the guitar at those sessions, using the bridge position for the majority of the distorted tones, but then it sounds like he's using the middle position for the thick, chunky sound that we hear on Sappy and Here She Comes Now. With this in mind, it's so confusing to me that three weeks later, on April 26th, Kurt smashed this guitar beyond repair. It is never seen again after this. I've always wondered if he regretted destroying what, at the time, was looking like would have been the main guitar used on Nirvana's second album. I've read that supposedly Kurt and Chris thought this was an extremely terrible show and one of their worst. So maybe he smashed it out of extreme frustration? Listening to that show myself, I personally don't hear anything that bad in their performance, other than them struggling with monitor problems and then eventually giving up while in the middle of negative creep. In this brilliant interview, Chris recalls sitting on a Fender Twin Reverb while tracking bass for Polly at the Smart Sessions. This could suggest that that's the amp that Kurt used. Kurt was traveling with his son Beta Leadheads, but it's very possible that Butch had a Twin Reverb in the studio. So my guess is that for the Smart Sessions, Kurt's rig was his Stella Harmony, ET270, Boss DS1, and possibly a Twin Reverb. What you've been hearing is me playing dive with my ET270, DS1, and Twin Reverb, and I honestly lit up when I heard how close this sounds to the official recording. To research for this video, and because I absolutely love this period of the band, I listened to and watched every available show where Kurt used his Epiphone. And here are some things that I noticed. It seems like he did not use the bridge cover. It's hard to say, because the first time we get a close enough look at it is the seventh show it was used at, which was on February 15, 1990. The bridge cover is not there, and we never see it on after. That does leave six shows where it could be on there but I'm guessing that either Kurt took it off right away or his didn't have it when he got it. It also seems like he didn't use the top strap button. I honestly don't blame him because it isn't an awkward spot. But in some photos, it doesn't even look like there's a strap button there. It looks like he instead opted to just tape his strap onto the horn with a huge wad of duct tape. He duct taped the bottom of the strap too, and there's a random tape wad here, but I have no idea what it could be for. Maybe it's to cover a crack in the body? Video-wise, this guitar is most notable for being in the alternate Sub Pop In Blue music video and in the Evergreen College TV studio video shoot. It's the main guitar that was used on February 9, 1990 at the Pine Street Theater in Portland, Oregon. That's the show that's included in the Bleach 20th Anniversary Edition. My personal favorite shows that this guitar was used at is February 16th at Bogarts and April 10th at Blind Pig. I highly recommend you check either of them out if you want to hear and see this guitar in action. This is my new Epiphone ET270. And when I say new, I mean it's new to me. It's a 1971, so it's a pretty old guitar. It's 51 years old, and I really lucked out with this one. It's in pristine condition. It feels great. I love the red finish on it a lot. And it sounds great too. The pickups are really unique, and it's hard to describe, but they sound really good. And I figured, after learning the history of the guitar, you'd want a quick sound sample to hear how it sounds. So I'll play some quick riffs on it on clean and distortion, and I'll go through all the pickup modes, and through every mode I'll have the bass switch on and off, so you can get a full idea of what this guitar sounds like.
This guitar also came with the original case, which is pretty cool, so I thought I would show that really quick. Whoever had it before me put some stickers on it. I guess this bomb one is supposed to be funny. There's also a vintage Dean Markley and Boss sticker on it, which is actually pretty cool. I use those and it's cool to have the vintage stickers on there. There's only three latches here on the side. And it's got a red interior, which kind of matches the color of the guitar itself. But I'm never going to use this to seriously transport this guitar. It feels really thin and flimsy and cheap, and it feels like if it got hit really hard, the guitar is not going to be protected. But it's a cool little collector's piece to have the original case. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Nirvana Guitars and to subscribe and check out my other Nirvana gear videos right here on YouTube.